There's an old African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Now, every village is equipped with gifts. There are gifts to invite, there are gifts to equip and teach, to encourage, to empower, and to send out. And all of these gifts are needed to build up the body of Christ here on earth. I'd like to share some stories from the village that raised me. I was born in Chicago, um, the only girl and the last child. So I had three older brothers, which was incredibly fun. <laughs> Uh, when I was less than a year old, we moved to northern Wisconsin to a small farm, and that was because my parents wanted us to be raised outside of the city. My mother usually grabbed us children, and uh, we would pray together at night before we went to bed. Uh, we were all a part of a Roman Catholic church at that time, so we went to church every Sunday. Now, not long after my parents were on the little farm, my father had an accident. He was working off the farm, and he had a severe back injury that required a lot of surgery and a lot of recovery and all sorts of things, and that was before workman's comp, so you can imagine what it did to our family uh, financially. It was difficult. Uh, my mother didn't drive either, and we lived out on a farm. So that added another dimension. Um, what happened was uh, my oldest brother, who was 12, imagine this, a 12-year-old, the sheriff gave him a permit to drive during the day so that it was called a hardship driver's license, but only during the day. So in the evening, any time we wanted to go anywhere or other times, um, we had an ex a wonderful group of neighbors who would transport us anywhere, who would do anything for us. They were just there to support us. And as I look back, I realized that that was my first experience with what it looks like to be in a community that loves their neighbor. It was incredible, and they were so helpful. Um, they took me to catechism, they took me to church, and our catechism at the time was pretty rules-based. Uh, we learned the uh, Ten Commandments, prayers of the church, the commandments of the church. We learned how to do a lot of processionals with flowers, and uh, it was just very rote, and I was good at memorizing things, so I flew right through it, but you know, I, it didn't have a lot of meaning to me. Um, one of the things I noticed when I talked to my Lutheran friends is that uh, the, they had to memorize a whole paragraph for each commandment. And I only had to learn a sentence. So I really felt sorry for those Lutherans. <laughs> um, I'm, my image of God at that time was that God was a disciplinarian, ready to pounce on me. He was very far off, and he was always watching to see if I was obeying the rules. And if I didn't, I better watch out. Life went along. I went to high school, graduated, and I continued to worship weekly, even though sometimes I didn't want to be there. That kind of was a gift to me as I look back from my Catholic upbringing, because you were required to go to church. That was a rule. Um, each Sunday, but it, it was helpful afterwards uh, as I look back. I went to college, and I found a very uh, comfortable place at the Newman Center, which was the uh, Catholic S Student Center, and at that time, uh, folk masses were in vogue, and it was all changing, and it was wonderful, and I loved it, and I felt right at home there. Um, now, at the beginning of my sophomore year of college, my faith was challenged. My mother was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia. The prognosis was poor, less than a year to live. And during that time, she was up and she was down as she received her chemo treatments, all kinds of blood products, and all kinds of medicines. It was at that time that I started bargaining with God, because remember, God was a disciplinarian. 
and I had a bargain with God because I felt like, for some reason, I felt I was being punished because of what I did in my mother's illness. And I was being punished, but <laughs> it wasn't because God wanted to punish me. Oh, I found myself pleading with God. I just said, you know, God, I'll do anything you want me to do if you just heal her. We need her. I need her. God listened, and God surrounded me with a supportive group of friends who literally dragged me to worship each Sunday. They surrounded me with love. They were in my village. My doormates also held the blood drive in my mother's honor, which was really very special to me. The summer between my sophomore and junior year, my mother died. It was like a bad dream. I went through the motions. I was in a fog. I felt numb. I felt betrayed by God. I was in deep grief. I would scream out at God, how could you do this to this wonderful person? She didn't do anything bad. The next minute, I would be sobbing uncontrollably, crying out for help to God. God didn't take my grief away, but God was present with me. And God listened, and God listened. And I screamed and I sobbed, and God listened. And again, God sent his people to surround me with love. Again, my neighbors, my friends, my family. The toughest piece of all of this was that after my mother's death, when my fam immediate family gathered together, they wouldn't talk about it. They were kind of denying their emotions. They were stuffing their emotions. So for me, who was acting out, that was a little bit tough. And I later learned that stuffing your emotions does not usually help. It's, it'll surface sometime later in life. I returned to college for my junior year. And of course, my grief journey wasn't over. You don't heal overnight. I was searching for meaning in all of this. So I heard about these little gatherings that were happening on campus, seances, Ouija board meetings. You could connect with your dead relatives and talk to them. Wow. You can imagine, I was very attracted to this. So I told my friends about them, and I told them I was going, and they said, well, yeah, we'll go with you. So they went with me. It was pretty freaky, pretty dark actually a very uncomfortable experience for me. Now, part of me wanted to continue to attend these seances because maybe at some point in time I could connect with my mother. But my friends, my village, convinced me to try a spiritual retreat instead. The Newman Center was offering retreats specifically designed for students who were going through tough times. So I went with a group of students to the Jesuit Retreat Center on Lake Winnebago. I found comfort. I found hope. I found life. I connected to God in prayer, in worship, in the silence, and in the beauty of God's creation. My faith has grown the most when I've gone through strifes. I now realize that. So fast forward in my years after college, um, my career goal changed because of my mother's illness. I uh, went to work in a medical lab uh, as a medical technologist, um, dealing with patients with leukemia and the study of hematology. Um, I felt very called to this position and actually worked as a med tech for, for many, many years. I felt called to be helping people and families. So I got married and uh, had a couple children, delightful gifts from God. Um, we brought them up in the church, and um, at the time of my marriage, I became a Lutheran. In my background, the missing piece, because the Catholic Church at that time did not encourage people to study the Bible in small groups, that was the missing piece. I really didn't have a good understanding of the Bible. So I felt a little insecure, and I felt like, ooh, how will I ever learn? 
I knew a lot about the stories in the Bible because I was going to church, and I, you know, we had them every Sunday, but it was never kind of in all together. A group of ladies uh, twice my age at the uh, church we joined in Beaver Dam invited me to a Bible study. They were incredible. Their names were Eunice and Ruth. They were welcoming, they were encouraging, and really patient with me. They never made me feel inadequate. I later joined a group of young mothers at the church when I had my children, and again, a wonderful, supportive group. So we moved to Mount Horeb because Arnie's job took him to a different part of the state. Um, this was difficult because I had, I had this nice group that I really enjoyed in my church in Beaver Dam. Uh, we looked around at congregations, and we finally settled into one, but uh, soon realized that this congregation was in a lot of turmoil, and it kept going and going and going, so we kept going and going and going too, but um, the turmoil was not helpful for spiritual growth. Um, after a time, we finally called a pastor who recognized the lack of biblical knowledge among the people. Uh, they were very thirsty for a biblical education. He offered a year-long survey of the Bible called the Divine Drama. It was a wonderful class. Over 30 people signed up. And this is where my spiritual awakening happened. <laughs> and interesting, one of the early hymns was about awakening. <laughs> God became so real to me, so close. I learned about God's promises to me to never forsake me, to always be with me, to be with me in my brokenness, in my struggles, and in my joys. I felt this extreme love for the first time in my life and the presence of the Holy Spirit, which I had never known before, and I thought, whew, wow. Yes, I was a lifelong church attender, but I had not felt that love that God had offered before because I thought of God as a disciplinarian. I have to tell you, this has made a big difference in my life, an incredible difference. Studying the word is transformational. That same strong spiritual leader encouraged me to lead ministries at the church, something I would never have dreamed of doing. I just never thought I had the gifts to do that. I always felt inadequate, not having enough knowledge of the Bible. Pastor Breck was a strong equipper and encourager, just like Pastor Rob. This awakening and strong presence of the Holy Spirit led me to enroll in the lay school in the South Central Senate of Wisconsin, taking seminary courses on weekends for three years. The Holy Spirit led me into the candidacy process for rostered ministry, which is a several-year process. During that time, I was accepted into clinical pastoral education at Meritor Hospital. That's a fancy name for chaplaincy. And it's a requirement for all seminarians who are going into the Word and Sacrament Ministry, which is what pastors do, or the Word and Service Ministry, which is for deacons, which is my title. I still serve as a night chaplain at Meritor, meeting with those who struggle with their illnesses or are in a crisis in any way. It's such a blessing and honor to be there with them, to be there when their families leave the earth. So you wonder probably how did they end up at New Heights? Hmm, that's another interesting piece. Remember I said the congregation I was in had turmoil? Well, uh, after Pastor Brack left, and he was a popular guy, and he did amazing things for that congregation. Um, we went through seven pastors in five years. And it was hard to keep focused. So I put my studies aside thinking, mm, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to go on, but I think there's still something there. But I also realized... Um, it was going to be painful, but I probably had to move on. The Holy Spirit was telling me this. So I followed God's lead to move on and uh, discovered that my gifts were used and needed in another place. Praise God. 
my first visit here, I sat in the back, of course. You know, that's where visitors like to sit. <laughs> I, I experienced the strong presence of the Holy Spirit. You could just touch it and feel it. It was just amazing. I was overwhelmed emotionally, so overwhelmed that I had to leave right after communion because I didn't want to talk to anybody. But I came back again, and I came back again, and then I brought Arnie with me. I felt like I had come home. Early on in my time here in my conversations with Pastor Rob, he encouraged me to finish my coursework for the rostered ministry. And I did. And the long and the short is I'm now on staff, and I feel so blessed to be a part of this wonderful staff here. It's just amazing, and to be among you, you're an amazing group of people. This is a safe place. It's special. It's warm. It's welcoming. This is a wonderful village. I've been blessed to be a part of several Bible studies. The people in those Bible studies are incredible. It's just amazing, and it's just such a wonderful thing. I would tell you to try to do that when you have a chance. The other piece is we have such a willing group that will help each other in this congregation. And I just want to give you a little example of what that might look like. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a person who needed some help with some work on the outside of their place. And um, I sent out an email to several guys, and they all answered the call and said they are going to come and help. And so the, one evening... They went over to this gentleman's place, and they spent some time, and I think it worked out well. And they, they were blessed, and I'm sure the person was blessed. So, you know, it's just so wonderful to have such a great group of people. There's so many ways that I see that in this congregation, so many ways. You can check out all the serve and care ministry opportunities, but it's beyond those. It's on an individual basis, too. New Heights is a place where our faith is always incubating, preparing us to go out into the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's continue to be always open to his call, no matter what our age is. Would you please pray with me? Gracious, loving God, thank you for all the people you place in our lives who nurture and care for you on this journey with you. Thank you for this loving community of believers, New Heights. Continue to work through us, to lead us, to share your mission in this world, to spread your light, to shine, to bless and heal the world. Amen.